This is Latter-day Presentations, where we discuss topics and issues of faith for Latter-day Saints. Welcome to today's presentation. Let's talk about basic critical thinking for Latter-day Saints. Critical thinking is a subject that has a lot to it, and it can be overwhelming. But I just want to cover some very basic tools in this presentation that can allow us to process a lot of our information a little bit better than we normally do. So let's go ahead and get started. And let's begin with some myths about critical thinking. One is, if I use critical thinking, I'll lose my faith. This is not true. I use critical thinking all the time, every day, and I love my faith. I'm very, very happy in my faith. Another myth is that critical thinking is destructive. It can be, but it can also be constructive. It can also improve our thinking. It can improve our perceptions and our understandings of things. Another myth is it's not possible to believe in the restored gospel if I use critical thinking. Again, absolutely not true. I am a very devout, committed believer in all the truth claims of the church and all of the foundational doctrines of the restoration. And I employ critical thinking constantly. Critical thinking is mean-spirited. It can be, but not necessarily. Uh, critical thinking, honestly, is not either mean or kind. It's just basically a tool set that we employ. And another final myth is critical thinking is negativity. That is not true. Critical thinking can be used in negative ways, but when it is, that often is just more a reflection of the disposition of the person using critical thinking. <laughs> uh, critical thinking is employed by positive, happy people all the time. So what is critical thinking? Well, it's analytical thinking. It's the ability to analyze information that, that we are presented with. And it's awareness, not necessarily attacking. Sometimes we get this impression that critical thinking is attacking things. Not really. It's more awareness and an ability to analyze things rather than pick them apart or destroy them. So our thinking is a product of these. We have kind of a base foundation of culture, which informs our worldview and shapes our life experiences. And we also have our own wiring, the way our, our brains are wired, right? People are wired differently. And from those things arise our epistemology, our desires, our values, our plausibility structures, and our mental horizons. Now, I mentioned plausibility structures. And what that phrase means is each of us has a framework in our minds for determining what we think is plausible or believable. And that is very, very heavily influenced by our culture. So each of us has plausibility structures. If something fits within my plausibility structures, that means I, I'm capable of believing it. If it doesn't fit, then I don't believe it. And again, different people have different plausibility structures. Those are definitely shaped by our culture. And our mental horizons, just the things that are kind of fit within our frame of reference based on our culture and our life experiences and, and other things. And our thinking is also a product of our assumptions, our definitions for terms and concepts, our reasoning skills, our biases and personal commitments, such as to reason, to ideology, to harmony, to order. A lot of these things are not really rational. They're not arrived at through rational processes. A lot of them have to do with our just our personal temperament, for example. So again, critical thinking is thinking that maintains an awareness of what we bring to our engagement with information. Critical thinking is thinking that is done with an awareness of these factors in our own thinking and that of others. Now let's talk about some examples. Here's one. I don't agree with the church's teachings on gender and sexuality because everybody should be able to love whoever they want. Okay, now is this a view that is common in some cultures and not others? That is something that's good to be aware of. Does this person have good definitions for their terms? The definition for love is very important in this situation. The way we define love 
matters a lot in terms of how we will process the church's teachings on gender and sexuality. And so it's good to be aware of the different ways that people define love. Why does this person use the word should? Who or what determines what is ideal? How is that person or system's view of the ideal revealed to us? So when somebody makes a should statement, like everybody should be able to love whoever they want, why are they saying should? On what basis have they arrived at their should here? That is something that's important to understand. And we can apply critical thinking here. Does this person have a concrete vision of the ideal they are expressing based in historical precedent or some kind of replicated scientific research? Or are they just expressing their own kind of view, their own hunch, their own worldview, their own perceptions of the way things should be? These are important questions that we can ask. And we can look at this statement and really analyze, you know, which of these concepts are products of culture and worldview and life experiences and wiring and so on and so forth. All of that is really at the heart of critical thinking. Now let's talk about logic. We mentioned reasoning skills earlier, and logic is a part of our reasoning skills. So let's begin with deductive logic. Here's an example of bad logic. All oranges are citrus fruits, and I'm holding a citrus fruit, therefore I'm holding an orange. That is bad logic. <laughs> I might be holding a lemon, that is a citrus fruit. Good logic says all oranges are citrus fruits, and I'm holding an orange, therefore I'm holding a citrus fruit. In other words, my conclusion, number three, it follows from my premises, number one and two, my assumptions, right? Now, when our assumptions are bad, our logic can actually be good, but we can arrive at erroneous beliefs because our assumptions are bad. So let's look at some examples of this. Here's what happens when we have bad assumptions. Oranges are not citrus fruits. Okay, that's a bad assumption, but let's, let's work with it. Oranges are not citrus fruits. I'm holding a citrus fruit. Therefore, I'm not holding an orange. All right. Now, number one in this situation is a bad assumption. It's just simply not true. But my logic is fine. Again, the quality of my assumption here determines the quality of my conclusion. Now let's look at an example of good assumptions and good logic. All oranges are citrus fruits. I'm holding an orange. Therefore, I'm holding a citrus fruit. Again, assumptions are good and the logic is good. Therefore, my conclusion is valid and sound, okay? Now, logic is an important part of the tool set of critical thinking. And let's look at another dimension of that. Logical fallacies. Logical fallacies are when I'm representing a concept, when I'm putting forth an argument for something or, or trying to teach a concept. Are there things that I say that are not well-founded, that don't actually contribute to the validity of what I'm saying, all right? Those are logical fallacies. An example is a straw man, which is creating an erroneous version of your opponent's argument, then arguing with that erroneous version, okay? An ad hominem is pointing to some flaw or shortcoming in your opponent in order to avoid discussing the merits of their views. In other words, oh, this person's argument is not good because this person is bad in some way. Well, bad people can sometimes say things that are true. So a non sequitur means it does not follow. And that's saying erroneously that one thing follows from or is the result of, of another. Poisoning the well is claiming that something renders a source of information unable to produce anything true or valuable. So if somebody is a member of a political party that I dislike and I wave off everything they say just because they are a part of a, a political party, right? That's a way of poisoning the well. It's basically saying nothing that this person says has any validity because look at this political party they belong to, right? And there are lots of examples of that. No true Scotsman is asserting that a person's viewpoint invalidates their standing. So... A lot of people oftentimes say, oh, no true scholar would adopt the view that 
uh, X, Y, Z scriptural stories are accurate or no true scholar would accept this or that other view, right? And the idea is, okay, if somebody holds this view that I disagree with, they're not really worthy of their professional credentials or, or whatever. We have a couple of images here of logical fallacy ref, and I love these memes online. Logical fallacy ref is really great. So here he's saying, we have an ad hominem attack. Personal foul attacked the opponent instead of his argument. And then illegal use of a straw man argument. Attempted deflection of an opponent's argument to a point they weren't defending. Play is no good. I recommend going through these logical fallacy ref memes. They're actually really good teaching tools for logical fallacies. Here is a big logical fallacy. And I think it is one of the most devastating to faith. And I see it all the time among people who have walked away from faith. It's the fallacy of composition. And the fallacy of composition basically says that what applies to one applies to all. In other words, if there's some subset of a group that is a certain way, then the whole group is that way, right? Assuming that if something is true of part of a group, it can be claimed for the whole group. Examples are... This car can drive off road, so all cars can drive off road. <laughs> My lawyer friend hates his job, so all lawyers hate their jobs. Tacos are gross. I had a plate of tacos once and I didn't like them. See how in each of these instances, I'm taking one point of information and extrapolating from that and making judgments about an entire group based on that, that one point of information. And here are some examples from faith. Jacob 5 is an allegory. So all scripture is allegorical. That's usually stated by people who have very narrow plausibility structures and don't want to believe in miracles and, and those kinds of things. I felt shame after hearing a church lesson. So that lesson is shame inducing. Well, other people might process that same church lesson in a way that is not shame inducing at all. They might process it in a joyful way, in a happy way. The way that I experience something is just one data point. It doesn't mean that it's experienced the same way by everybody else. I haven't witnessed a healing miracle, so nobody else has witnessed one. Or prophetic teachings have not always been correct, so every prophetic teaching is questionable. And finally, church members and leaders failed to stop abuse in this situation. Therefore, they always fail to stop abuse. From time to time, we have these horrible stories that arise in the church of abuse. And it is a nightmare every time we hear about these things because it's so horrible. And most of the time, I would say church members and leaders respond very well to situations of abuse but occasionally they don't and it's heartbreaking and frankly any failed response to abuse is absolutely unacceptable but an occasional misstep and screw up in this area doesn't mean that our whole system is fundamentally bad it might be in need of improvement here and there but we can't extrapolate from extreme cases or outlier cases that an entire system is bad or fails all the time. So again, these are critical thinking skills that we can apply to things that we hear in conversations about faith, conversations about the church and how it operates. Okay, so let's talk some more about assumptions and the power of assumptions. Some people claim that prophets are wrong about things. So if I say prophets are wrong about X, what assumptions might be at work when I make a statement like that? Well, I might be assuming that prophets have not received revelation about X. Now, how do I arrive at that assumption? Well, I might be thinking that they haven't disclosed a specific revelation, and I assume that every time they receive revelation, God wants them to disclose it. Or I might be assuming that they have not disclosed revelation, so they have not received any. And that's a non sequitur, by the way. There are plenty of instances where prophets may be given revelation and be told to be very discreet about sharing it. 
Their claims to revelation are invalid because they don't follow a process I understand to be the only valid one. And that's, again, a non sequitur. We can all develop these frameworks based on scripture and other things as to what constitutes a valid process for prophetic revelation. But those are just constructs. God might be operating with a different construct than we are. And another example, prophets have been wrong before. Okay, so that is a non sequitur and it's also poisoning the well. The fact that a prophet has been wrong about something before absolutely does not mean they're wrong about something in the present day. Okay, prophets have not correctly discerned revelation about X. That might be something that I'm assuming here. And part of that assumption is that I am better at discerning God's will than prophets are. Well, is that true? <laughs> These are important questions for us to ask. These are important assumptions for us to be aware of when we hear people claiming that prophets are wrong about something. Now let's talk about critical thinking about statistics. Why do I bring this up? Well, years ago, I was watching a documentary about sharks and there were people who love sharks talking about sharks. And one of them said, sharks are not something that we should be afraid of because you're more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to be attacked by a shark. So what this person did, I assume, is they just took the number of people that are struck by lightning every year and the number of people that are attacked by sharks every year. And they said the number of people struck by lightning is greater than the number of people attacked by sharks. And therefore, one situation is more probable than the other. That is really poor statistical reasoning. If somebody says statistically, you're more likely to be struck by lightning than bitten by a shark, you should then ask, well, what if I'm swimming in shark infested waters? Am I still more likely to be struck by lightning than attacked by a shark? That's why when we talk about statistics, context matters a lot and we need to differentiate between correlation and causation and just spurious correlation right things that seem related but are not really related now here are a couple of examples and this is from uh, a website by a guy named tyler Vigan, and and he has a piece of software that kind of goes through sets of data and finds these spurious correlations, okay? So here's an example. Letters in winning word of the Scripps National Spelling Bee correlated with the number of people killed by venomous spiders. Now, if you look at that graph, you would say, wow, that is a pretty strong correlation between those two things. <laughs> so uh, for some reason, when they increase the when they put forward words in the national spelling bee that have high numbers of letters, that somehow causes venomous spiders to get angry and attack people. You might invent some weird explanation for that correlation, right? But these two things have nothing to do with each other. And it's important to understand that regardless of how much they look correlated. Here's another one. People who drowned after falling out of a fishing boat correlates with the marriage rate in Kentucky. And you could look at that and say, wow, I see some correlation between those trend lines. So maybe when people drown after falling out of a fishing boat at the funerals, people meet each other and get married, right? I might come up with some kind of an explanation to try to explain this correlation, but these things are not related again. So critical thinking definitely needs to apply to questions of statistics. Where do we see statistics applied to our faith? We see it in statements like Latter-day Saints are more likely to, and those are used to make claims that our faith leads to any number of good or bad behaviors. Why should we approach these claims with critical thinking? Well, the problem is our experiences of faith are extremely varied. Some Latter-day Saints have deeper conversion to the restored gospel than others. Measures of activity, for example, tell us little about how a person really feels about their faith. And geography matters a lot. Living our faith in Utah 
introduces a host of cultural factors that are not experienced by saints in places where we are a small minority. So a lot of times statistics are invoked in statements like, oh, in Utah, there are high rates of this or high rates of that. And the idea is the person is trying to portray the church as the cause of something. Well, maybe it's not at all. Is that phenomenon experienced at a greater rate by people who are actually converted to the restored gospel versus people who are going to church for social reasons or people who are not members of the church at all? So when people say, oh, there are higher rates of this or that in Utah, again, we need to apply some critical thinking to those kinds of statements. When people say Latter-day Saints have high rates of this or that, is that relative to other populations? And after accounting for variables like intermountain geography and even weird worldview, weird just means Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, all right? So people in those kinds of countries have a different worldview than people who do not live in weird countries. So people in the global south, for example, in South America and, and Africa and places like that, are those statistics applicable to them as well as Latter-day Saints? And if not, then worldview is a very important variable to consider. So this is all part of critical thinking. And finally, I want to talk about categorizing our thinking. Okay, we have this pyramid and at the bottom we have a large amount of data. And when we have data and we take it and we contextualize it and organize it, it becomes information. When we take that information and we corroborate it and we determine its validity or lack of validity, then it rises to the level of knowledge. And then when we ask questions of ultimate good and we weigh contraries and exercise value judgments in response to that knowledge, eventually we arrive at wisdom. And it's interesting, you know, when in the scriptures, when they say, woe unto the learned who think they're wise, okay, woe unto the people who have lots of data and information, and they mistake that for wisdom. All right. Data is not the same as wisdom. And if we apply critical thinking and we learn how to exercise ethical judgments in response to information and those kinds of skills, we can actually arrive at wisdom. But that's a long process and it's a lot more challenging than just having lots of data and information available to spout off for this or that view that we hold. So categorizing our thinking in matters of faith, it's a very, very important skill in critical thinking. Anyway, I hope this presentation has been helpful. There's a lot more that can be said about this, but this is just a basic primer. And I hope that people who have an interest in developing more critical thinking skills will really explore that because the church can benefit from that. Thank you for joining me today. This has been an episode of Latter-day Presentations. We would like to remind viewers that our channel represents our own views and not necessarily any official positions of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We hope this presentation has been informative. Our notes for this show are at Nauvoo Neighbor and the link can be found in the show description. Also in the show description, we have a link to provide feedback. If you would like to suggest a topic for discussion, or if you would like to contribute a presentation on a topic of interest to you, let us know. Thanks again for joining us.